Hey everybody, what's happening? I hope you had a great weekend. Uh, in today's Ask Elvis video, it should be a good one. We've got questions on Aston Martin back in Formula One and what's been going on behind the scenes there. Uh, we've got questions around the F1 2020 Codemasters game and how do they judge real world car performance when there's no real world racing happening right now? Uh, there's questions on sim racing and how that might affect a driver's real world performance as well. Loads and loads of stuff happening, loads and loads of questions being generated. So without further ado, let's crack on and see how many we can get through. Can't stop seeing vortices everywhere I look. <laughs> right, let's start with this one from Carl Slocum talking about the potential race calendar, maybe starting in July. He says, if F1 goes behind closed doors in July, what will the financial impact be to the circuits, the teams and the owners? Is the thought that racing for TV advertising revenue is better than not racing at all? And he goes on to say, damn it, should have had hashtag Ask Elvis on that one. Um, <laughs> well, thanks, Carl. Uh, you did remember, and that is how I found it. So thank you for your question. Um, the truth is, everybody's going to be financially impacted hugely. I mean, not obviously not just in Formula One, across the world by this whole thing. But if Formula One does decide to go racing again at some point whenever whenever it's safe to do so and they start to do that behind closed doors so without fans at a racetrack the people that are going to be hit hardest in that situation would be the circuits themselves because of course the way that that business model works is the circuit pays a huge race hosting fee uh, to Formula One itself and in return for that they get to make money from selling tickets to fans and selling merchandise within the circuit confines. Now that is that is their revenue model so if we're going to hold races without fans in attendance well then well then Formula One needs to step in and compensate them somehow for that they need to make it worth their while because Formula One stands to lose out in a huge way, you know, with some far-reaching consequences if we don't have any racing in 2020. And so they have to get some racing going. So they need the circuits perhaps more than the circuits need them. So F1 or Liberty, however you want to describe them, have to step in at some point and essentially, putting it very bluntly, they're going to have to pay the circuits to stage these races so that the circuit can still make some money and F1 still gets its you know, gets its race being held. If we don't get any racing happening, if we don't go down this route potentially and Formula One doesn't manage to stage a championship, well, they might have to pay back. I mean, hundreds of millions in race hosting fees that have already been paid, in sponsorship deals that will need to be reimbursed because, you know, without any exposure for these sponsors, why on earth would they want to pay any money? They might potentially lose teams and that would be tragic for Formula One in itself so there's a huge desire to get some racing happening and it may well be that the uh, the palms need to be greased of the circuits to enable that to happen if we're not going to allow fans in through the door. The other thing of course with racing behind closed doors without fans is that if we're saying it's not safe to allow you know thousands of fans to congregate together in a the confines of a racetrack because we risk spreading the uh, the infection further. Well, is it safe to start bringing the thousands of people that are still needed to stage a Formula One race in terms of teams and staff and marshals and circuit officials and all the other people that are needed, even in the most basic sense, broadcast crews and, and all these people, is it safe to ask them to come together in the confines of a racetrack? And I've already spoken to a number of people at the teams who are not particularly comfortable with this idea. And I know there is talk of uh, testing staff as they sort of enter the circuit, but you know, that's gotta be a pretty robust system, isn't it? If you're gonna ask people to, to come and, and, uh, and do this kind of thing, just to put on a show, which is essentially what it is. So I think there are lots of questions to be answered around that. And of course, everybody's having to wait and, and just go off what the government guidelines are in each particular country. Um, and see how the whole thing develops. It's a, it's a very much a moving target right now. 
That's Stephen Cole says, uh, with more races likely to be cancelled or rescheduled, with Belgium likely to be changed, I wonder if F1 should consider a WEC style super season if they are able uh, a handful of races, if they're able to do a handful of races this season. Um, so that's been talked about a lot, hasn't it? It's even been discussed amongst the uh, the teams and the um, stakeholders of Formula One. So that has been on the table. It sounds like, and I'm only going off what I've read in the press on this one, uh, it sounds like that's unlikely to happen. It feels like there's more of a desire to try and get back to 2021 as being a, what, you know, something more of a standard season. So let's try and get in whatever we can in this year. There are also contractual reasons why maybe doing that wouldn't satisfy the contractual terms of contracts around things like sponsors, race uh, hosting agreements, broadcasting agreements. Um, if you combine the two seasons, I suspect there's wording in contracts that mean that wouldn't necessarily satisfy uh, the various demands on either side of those contracts. So I think if we can, we want to try and get something done in 2020 and keep 2021 as a standard season if, we, if it's possible. Uh, Rob Booth asks this one. He says, question for the next Ask Elvis. Instead of multiple races at the same track, how about staging races at more than one track in the same country to minimise travel? Silverstone and Donington, Barcelona, Jerez. Obviously some tracks may uh, no longer be up to standard and require work. Well, Rob, that is exactly the point. There are, certainly if you look at the UK, there are no other tracks that tick all the boxes to stay to currently stage a Formula One race. It is only Silverstone that's invested in the infrastructure and everything required to bring it up to Formula One level. So that's the biggest hurdle. And maybe that some of those restrictions could be relaxed if we really wanted to do that. The other thing is that travel is not actually the biggest problem because packing up the F1 circus and moving it between Silverstone and Brands Hatch, which would be awesome by the way, going back to Brands, uh, or Donington or wherever else, it's almost negligible in terms of the difference between moving it between Silverstone and, say, Barcelona. You know, there's a, a day or so of actual on-the-road time, but the whole pack-up and rebuild process is, is still huge. And if, I guess the point of trying to do multiple races at the same circuit is that we're trying to minimise the number of days that teams and the personnel are away from home, as well as trying to cram in as many races into a short space of time as possible. And there are some circuits that can offer multiple layouts, Silverstone being one. Paul Ricard has an endless variety of layouts. So there are a couple of places where we could do very different races, but within the confines of the same circuit. So still loads of options. I just think we've got to wait and see how the whole global situation develops before anyone can start making any firm plans. I find it slightly strange that Formula One are still adamant we're going to try and squeeze in 15 to 19 races in whatever gap we end up having left putting together a provisional calendar when we have no idea when all these restrictions are going to be lifted there we go they're under some pressure to do it i guess uh, monster matty says this um, with wolf buying a share albeit a small one in aston martin could this be a first step to a standalone aston martin team uh, in f1 in the years to come P.S. We are really are hungry for any F1 uh, this year, aren't we? Well, I'm not sure that Toto Wolf buying a small share in Aston Martin is necessarily a trigger for the brand coming back into Formula One in an even bigger way. Lawrence Stroll buying Aston Martin with his team of or his consortium of investors, well, that absolutely is what's going to trigger Aston Martin coming back in a bigger and bigger way. He's already rebranding the Racing Point team, of course, next year as Aston Martin, and he absolutely sees. Formula One as an intrinsic part of his strategy for rebuilding Aston Martin and turning it into a, a hugely profitable enterprise, which is of course what he does so very well. He's a passionate racer and he absolutely sees the two very much linked. So I can really see Aston Martin's involvement in Formula One growing over the next few years, but I don't necessarily think that's don't necessarily think we can yet judge that that has anything to do with Toto Wolf buying a small percentage share at this stage. Uh, Shane Dunn says, Hi Mark, love all the content as usual. Thank you very much, Shane. Uh, with the Racing Point team rebranding to Aston Martin, clearly Lawrence Stroll is serious about his new F1 team. Does this mean that Lance's seat is safe? There's a lot of drivers out there that I'm sure could do a better job than Lance. So what happens to Lance? You know, there's a feeling amongst Formula One fans that 
Lance is probably only there because of, you know, his dad's money and his dad's investment in the teams. Is that fair? Well, it's obviously helped, hasn't it? There's absolutely no question that he's had a huge step up, a huge advantage over other drivers, some of whom may be more talented to get to where he is in Formula One. Having said that, Lance Stroll is not a terrible driver by any stretch of the imagination. And I, I think we really need to give him a chance this year, if we get any racing or next year, given that he's now potentially in a competitive car um, in this racing point, or the old Mercedes, whichever way you want to look at it. Given that he's now in a competitive car, we need to give him the opportunity to see what, or to show what he can do with that kind of equipment. And I think that would be the fairest way to look at this. And I'm sure that that will be how Lawrence will look at it too. He'll give his son an opportunity. And he's given him, let's be fair, he's given him a great opportunity, not only in the Williams and also in the Racing Point, but now in a Racing Point that seems to be, on the face of it at least, pretty competitive. He's now got a proper opportunity can't get much more opportunity than this to show what he can do at the highest level of motorsport. And if he can deliver up against the, what is a pretty decent benchmark of Sergio Perez, if he can deliver, well then maybe we can all change our opinion and say he deserves his seat there. If he can't deliver, I'm pretty sure that Lawrence will take the decision to put the brand and the company and the race team above his loyalty to his son in terms of, of trying to move the, 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 the whole thing forward. There's now an awful lot of money tied up in this. There's a huge amount of investment, particularly with the Aston Martin link-up, that he will not want to jeopardise without having the two best drivers he can get into his car. Uh, Matt Coulter over on the Seedstream app asks this one. Hi Mark, I've been wondering what happens to outdated or broken carbon components. Do teams recycle them to produce new parts? Love the vids, keep them coming. Uh, thanks very much Matt. And uh, yeah, so yes, the answer is that any crash damaged or uh, shunted components made out of carbon fibre are crushed at the Formula One team and then recycled. As far as I know, nobody recycles them into further F1 components. Uh, each one of the, the new components for an F1 car are made from scratch. Uh, and that's really just to make sure that they can absolutely guarantee performance and reliability and integrity in the structures of the, uh, the new carbon fibre components. But the old carbon fibre that's crushed is sent away and recycled. So it's not just scrapped, it's not just thrown away. They will all do, and even more so nowadays, teams are putting more and more effort into becoming as sustainable and as uh, reusable, if you like, in terms of their materials as possible. So, yes, things do get recycled. Uh, Ardigen, I think I've got that right, maybe, on Twitter, says, uh, Can you be my dad? <laughs> I presume that came after that video I did with my kids <laughs> last week. <laughs> Um, he says your videos are awesome. No wonder school, uh, no wonder you school corporations. <laughs> Thanks very much. I did have a silly Ask Elvis question, but it's late. Okay, why not? He says, with Lando and Charles and others streaming F1 races, having fun and crashing, will it eventually affect their actual racing? I.e., send it. <laughs> um, I don't think it will, you know, because for many of these drivers, they have been doing virtual racing long before they ever got into an actual Formula One car. You know, Lando and Max, I know particularly, Charles is new to this, but Lando and Max have been doing this for years, racing very seriously online, uh, as well as their real world activities. So there's a very big distinction, oh God, <laughs> there's a very big distinction between the two. And I don't think any racing driver is going to start using some of their online techniques when it comes to real world racing. Having said all of that, anything that you do over and over and over again starts to build into your internal memory, doesn't it? Your muscle memory, the memory you know, in your mind, the experiences that you build up are always being banked and they're always being added to. And those experiences are what you then draw on when it comes to a real life situation. So I don't think it will affect it, but I guess perhaps a psychologist can answer this one better than I can. Maybe there's some tiny effect that it could have, given that this is happening a lot now.
Uh, right, a couple of things. First of all, I've just got home, started editing the footage from the first half of this video and realised there's that really annoying rattling sound, which I have heard before on some of my videos and thought it was the little cable that runs out of the mic into the back of the camera rattling against the camera body. I've just realised that it wasn't that, it's this tiny little collar that had wound loose uh, around the, uh, the mic input. So apologies for that, I know it's really, really annoying. But hopefully it's fixed now, you won't hear it again. So that's that. Secondly, uh, you may remember I told you I was entering a, uh, an online race, sim race, on Saturday morning uh, that the guys on Seedstream had organised. Uh, I did that, it was a huge amount of fun. Uh, this was how the start of the race unfolded. It was absolute chaos and carnage. I started at the back after a terrible qualifying, wormed my way through cars that were spinning and crashing out all over the place. It was actually a pretty decent start, uh, opening lap. Unfortunately it went slightly downhill from there and um, I had an unforced error, let's say, <laughs> and the race was a bit of a disaster. But I loved it, it was such fun and just being the first time that I actually competed with other people online was brilliant, I really loved it. I can totally see why people get hooked uh, on sim racing. So I will definitely be doing more of that. Um, it was a great fun experience. So thank you to the guys over at Seastream for organizing and uh, there will be more. They're already planning the next one. Uh, right, now whilst we're talking about sim racing and gaming, there's another question on that very subject. It comes from Jack Troost who says, so with the release of the new F1 2020 game trailer, I had a question. How do you think they'll determine in-game car performance if the season starts after the release? Uh, will it be based on winter testing or last year or just adjusted slightly? Uh, so to answer that question fully, because the truth is I didn't really know the answer completely, I got in touch with uh, Codemasters uh, on your behalf and the game director has come back to me and given me this response. He says, uh, so far we're going off the end of last year, the potential best times from testing Plus, we've spoken with the team at F1 to see if our expectations match with theirs. Uh, as always, we will launch and then update accordingly. Hope that helps. Um, so there, I think that really does help. So they are basing it off the performance that we know from last year, the performance they've gained through pre-season testing, but interestingly, and I mean, maybe it's no surprise, but I'm really pleased that they do, the guys at the F1 team at Codemasters are talking to the real life F1 team, if you like, at, uh, at Liberty, at Formula One, to sort of get their idea, their picture of how the performance levels of each team and each driver stacks up. And if we do get some racing happening in 2020, then the performance characteristics in game will be updated as the season progresses and we get a clearer picture. So hopefully, uh, Jack, I hope that, uh, that answers your question. 29 Speed 6 says, Hello Mark, in reviewing your comments regarding the 2020 Renault, you spoke about how the new narrow nose cone on the old style chassis was a mismatch. My question would be, if Renault or any team would make a change, would they have to re-crash test? Um, so that's referring to my review, my tech review of the car, the Renault car when it was launched, in that they were reusing last year's chassis, which incidentally will mean now that they have to use that chassis again for 2021 because of the new restrictions that everybody's agreed to carrying this year's cars over to next year, which means that chassis effectively will be doing three seasons, which is very unusual in Formula One terms. But anyway, to get to your question, and I apologize for the wind, by the way, it's really windy and I haven't got one of those big wind socks for this particular mic. I will address that at some point, but I haven't got one yet. Um, so to answer your question, the truth is yes. If you, um, if you redesign things like a nose cone, the chassis, the side impact structures, the rear crash structure on the back of the car, those things all need to go through full FIA crash testing to be approved for racing. Um, now that's absolutely achievable, you can do that, but it does mean that it's a longer, more drawn out process, uh, more involved process than perhaps re redesigning something like a wing which is not part of an official crash structure. So yes, the nose cone, the chassis are all parts. If you want to change them, they need to go through a crash testing process and be approved. And that process can be expensive because particularly with something like a chassis, I mean, you, you're destroying one of your chassis through that process, pretty much. In that, it may not get destroyed, but most teams would never you or never would never race the chassis that had been through the crash testing because essentially it gets a huge amount of load put through it and even if it passes that crash test i.e doesn't deform 
you know, within the comf within the restrictions that the FIA set out, it can compromise the uh, the structural integrity of that chassis, and therefore you wouldn't want to race it again. Um, so that means there's an expense to that, and it takes time. Um, there's no guarantee you'll pass first time, so it's not one of those really easy updates that you can constantly be bringing to a car on a regular basis. As I say, absolutely achievable, it just has to be planned in and scheduled in, knowing that it's going to take a bit longer than something smaller. Chris says, uh, would the remainder of the 2020 season be a good time to test things like reverse grids and other proposed innovations? Absolutely, Chris. Yeah, if we get a shortened season, uh, if we get a handful of races, potentially even if we can't fit in a full championship, which is eight races, by the way, if you didn't know, you need at least eight races uh, to be able to constitute a, a championship. Now, whether we do that or not, if it's given that it's a different season, it's going to be compromised, it's going to be different to what we're all used to, it's absolutely a great opportunity to throw in some, some test items. And, and that's even more the case if it doesn't form a championship. If we run some demo races or some experimental races uh, towards the end of this season, but don't call it a championship, we can try pretty much whatever we want. And I think most people have an appetite to do that. It's been discussed. Rever things like reverse grids have been discussed. Things like different qualifying formats and all sorts of different things. I mean, almost if we get to that point, there's an open canvas to try whatever we want, which could be really exciting and could be a great opportunity to just run these things in the real world and see how they work. Dennis says, I was wondering what's happening regarding the Concord agreement. Is it that all teams are going to sign for 2021 only or sign up for the full term or even leave the sport if the economic situation is worse? Uh, so that's a good point. It expires. The current agreement expires at the end of this year, end of 2020. Uh, so there's lots of negotiations going on, as there were before we went, we entered this global health pandemic, about the terms and the negotiations that might happen for the next agreement starting from 2021. Now, those, are, those conversations are still happening behind the scenes. Uh, there's lots of disagreement, as there always is in these kind of things, and they're nowhere near, as far as I understand, coming to an actual agreement yet, because there's so many other things to discuss as well. So many other major to topics and talking points that we've already covered. Um, now, uh, will they sign up for an extra year? I think that's unlikely. I think it's unlikely they would just extend the current agreement uh, for another year because there are so many things in this agreement which are perhaps unfeasible moving forward, particularly even more so given the situation we're all now in, particularly things like the financial arrangements. So I think uh, there's a definite um, move towards a new agreement. That's absolutely got to be the focus. Um, Will teams leave the sport? That's a definite possibility, as we've as we've discussed. You know, very much depends on what happens over the next few months. But I think there's a high chance we will see at least one team, maybe more, leaving Formula One, and that's another challenge the sport has to face. What can happen, and what has happened in the past, as precedent for this, is that we could get to the start of 2021, like a brand new season without having a Concord agreement in place. We've had that before, where teams have agreed to race on without having a formal agreement in place. Now that's definitely not what anybody wants because it provides a huge amount of uncertainty. You know, Liberty don't want that, the teams don't want that. There's a massive desire to get an agreement done. And so I think there'll be a huge focus put on that, a huge amount of effort put onto that. But as ever, there's, uh, you know, an unwillingness to compromise. What I think we all hope is that given the current situation, that willingness to compromise might be shifted just a little bit. And people might see there's an absolute need to compromise now more than ever, and we might get a little bit closer towards an agreement than we might otherwise have. So the truth is that, uh, or the answer to the question is, there are massive amounts of conversations happening in the background. There's no agreement yet, and it won't necessarily stop the season from happening next year if we don't have one but I think everyone will prefer to have that in place uh, before we start turning wheels in 2021, if at all possible. Uh, David Miras says, uh, Hi Mark, what, if any, were you allowed to keep from your time as a mechanic? Pit overalls, mechanics helmets, front wings, pistons, <laughs> uh, other memorabilia. You can include stuff that may have fell off the back of a truck, because I think there's been water under that bridge by now. <laughs> um, so I didn't, I, I, I kind of regret not keeping my pit stop overalls. I wish I had. Um, it wasn't that I wasn't necessarily allowed. I probably could have done and my pit stop helmet. 
I just didn't really think about it. And, uh, you know, it's one of the things I would have loved to have had, um, maybe hung on the wall in a games room or something. But um, anyway, I didn't take that. I have got some great items though. Uh, a couple of my favorites are champagne bottles that Kimmy had given me from particular races. You've already seen, I think some of you, uh, the crash helmet that Kimmy gave me with a little inscription on the back. That's one of my most special um, pieces of, uh, of, of memorabilia, I guess. And I've got lots of things like team kit. I did say a while ago I would do a video on unpacking some of that team kit or some of that, that stuff that I've collected over the years and talk about the stories that it that go along with it. So I will definitely do that. So watch this space and I'll start to show you some more of that stuff because it needs bringing down from the loft and sorting. And maybe that's a good excuse for me to get on and do that. Bob Campbell says, do you think it's bad that people like myself find the technical videos and items from yourself and from Sky F1 much more interesting than the racing itself? And do you think that new regulations could change this? Well, Bob, the whole point of Formula One is that people should be watching the core product, which is Formula One. So yes, if people are not as interested in the actual racing as they are some of the stuff around the periphery, that's a problem, isn't it, with our sport? That, and I'm not saying that is the case, it clearly is with you, but but you know that's a problem that Formula One has to address. And yes, the 20, what were the 2021 regs, which are now the 2022 regs, um, that's exactly what they are trying to do. It's trying to make the core product better, more interesting, closer, more exciting, more unpredictable. Because if we have that, it, the idea is it draws people back towards the racing. I'm really pleased that you find uh, you know some of the, the technical content that me and others uh, produce because that's my area of speciality I guess that's what got me interested in the sport in the very beginning was the technical side and it's a passion of mine so I'm really pleased that you're enjoying it first of all but yeah I really hope that the the next generation of Formula One cars and the next generation of regulations including the financial ones that hopefully will level the playing field a little bit might just bring everything back a little bit closer so that the competition in Formula One is closer and the on-track action delivers a spectacle that's worth watching because you're certainly not alone in drifting away from the, you know, being attracted to the racing. So I hope we can get that back sooner rather than later. Okay, let's finish up with this one from Jonathan Moore, who says, Mark, this is all over social media for the 10th anniversary, but can you explain what happened? Uh, well, here it is. Uh, Buemi having that now infamous accident, I guess, where both front wheels attached from the car in a pretty spectacular shunt. Uh, luckily, he was fine. He was all OK. But I mean, what a dramatic incident. Ten years ago. Can you believe that? Well, the team said that it was an upright failure uh, that caused the incident. And what's interesting, of course, to most people is that it appears that both wheels detached at exactly the same time. But if we slow the footage down, what I hope you'll be able to see here is if I go frame by frame, you can see that it's actually the right front that has the problem first. Let me just wind that back. So just going one frame at a time, just there, the right front wheel has already got a problem. You can see that the tire is starting to detach and deflate. And what happens there is because that's happening at such high speeds, when Buemi hits the brakes at that velocity, the load going transferring through to the front axle and the front uprights is huge at that point. Then we've had an upright failure on the right front wheel, which has detached the tire. That then pitches all of that loading into a really unnatural uh, point on the car. And within a split second, the load that's increased on the left front tire, the unnatural load, is so great that there's obviously had what seemingly what seems like exactly the same failure happen on the left front so the problem was obviously on the right front but then very quickly because of that the result of that meant the same problem happened on the left front both uprights failed both wheels detached and the resulting accident was one that was pretty spectacular and <laughs> kind of goes down in in f1 folklore now doesn't it but that was the reason for it that uh, the team explained that there was a and you might say well how can an upright fail well everything is designed to take a certain amount of of load isn't it and no more than that really because any more than that means you're probably adding excess weight that you don't need so everything's designed to take a certain load capacity but because sometimes you can get quite close to that load capacity and sometimes tip over the top and if they've designed that too close to the load capacity that the car sees on a regular basis and on that odd occasion it's just tipped over that that line 
you very quickly get a failure and the failures can be pretty significant, severe, catastrophic and spectacular as we see in this case. Um, but there you go, that's the reason. Upright failure on the right hand side, massive loading caused the upright failure on the left hand side all within a couple of fractions of a second and there's the result. There you go. Um, I hope you've enjoyed today's video guys. Uh, I do apologise if the wind noise has been really bad and of course for the rattling. I hate it when I look back after I've filmed these videos and there's an issue like that or something's gone out of focus. I really, it annoys the hell out of me. It's such a difficult thing to do when you're doing this all by yourself. You don't, you don't tend to, to find these issues, particularly with audio until you sit down in the edit afterwards. But uh, there you go, apologies. I will try and avoid them in the future by, uh, well, I've fixed one of them. I'll try and get one of those little um, dead cats to go over the microphone and hopefully that will stop that happening again. But in the meantime, I hope you managed to enjoy it. If you did, give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel if you're not already. Um, if you're into Formula One and cars and technology, that's what we talk about all the time on here. Um, there's also now a back catalogue of well over 380 videos. So if you are bored in this time when you're locked down in your homes, consider going to check them out. They're normally about 10 minutes long. These Ask Elvis videos are much longer every Monday, but typically 10 or 15 minutes out of your day and you might find yourself just a little bit entertained. Maybe you'll even learn something. Anyway, thanks very much, folks. Keep the comments coming, keep the questions coming, and I'll try and answer as many as I can online. And I'll see you again very soon. Ta-da!